Fair time. Quick. All right. Where were we? I got the memo. I got the memo. Here I got it. I didn't get it. No, that might be for uh, It's 5 15. Uh, today is uh, October 11th. Uh, Wednesday. Uh, this is a scheduled uh, city council workshop. Around the table, we have Councillor uh, Sprague, Councillor Davitt, Councillor Pelletier, Councillor Leonard, Councillor Thumble, Councillor Yakabaga, myself, Councillor Fournier, and we are joined by uh, City Manager Deb Rory. Uh, first up on the agenda is uh, American Rescue Plan Act. Yes. So the First item on tonight's agenda is just kind of the update um, from Health Equity Alliance from our last offer meeting. Um, there were um, a few questions um, asked for follow up. Um, kind of, um, there was a request as to um, regarding, there were some questions raised regarding the stability of future funding. Others were interested in how change in the location was viewed by the downtown partnership and what opportunities this presents to align outreach work with other outreach efforts within the city. So um, doing um, what we did, we came back with a whole bunch of follow-up information from Heal. Um, they are gonna work very collaboratively with uh, Bangalore Public Health, um, actually going to be starting to coordinate us with us and our work with PCHC on Pet A vaccines. Um, they will, their outreach will participate in weekly outreach. They'll do data. They'll coordinate all efforts with every partner as required in the homeless response system, you know, coordinated entry, uh, the hub activities, as well as HMIS. And then sort of off to the side is the, the city efforts that we do as well, um, actually trying to better align all of our resources. Uh, they've worked with a number of groups, Bangalore Public Health, the Library, Wealth Train, Homeless Shelter, uh, Hope House, CHCS, Together Place and Barn. They really do have a, a collaborative approach to this uh, funding. Um, they actually went through a technical assistance uh, process and strategic plan a couple of years ago regarding uh, revenue models. Um, the assistance training and support design support they received is the backbone of the proposed ongoing funding model. For the resource center, um, this assistance was not grant funded, carried a fee of $50,000 and a trip to Texas to learn firsthand weekly support via Zoom to assist HEAL setting up infrastructure and feedback on the design. Um, they've also over the summer been doing some supplementary technical support through the Rural Health Redesign Center and um, with Josh Miller, I looks like he was previously involved in the opioid technical assistance. Um, the deliverables included providing a guide on best practice operational policies and procedures for opening, running a culturally competent testing and treatment program. Um, they are confident that they've done the prep work necessary, uh, that their financial forecasts are, are appropriate and stable, and that the 340B funding will provide a sustainable uh, financial um, revenue stream for them to continue uh, the work beyond the expiration of the ARPA funds. Uh, also, uh, we did include um, a statement from the Downtown Bengal Partnership. Um, they were pleased um, that the Resource Center um, and have always supported the efforts of, of what's being proposed by HEAL. They felt that the Resource Center and Hank Hunt's right. relay some concerns um, that you know of curb management and those types of things that were raised by their constituents. Um, they do believe and have talked to folks about the fact that the outreach team would be downtown, but the outreach folks would be outside providing support and it wouldn't be a draw to the location. So that, that kind of helped ease some minds. The outreach team will, will obviously focus uh, within downtown Bangor, as we do know that there's a high concentrations of individuals. It will not be limited to that and they'll work collaboratively with the city so that we are sort of not walking over each other and, and walking in concert with each other. Uh, right now, the outreach operations are planned 8.30 to 5. Um, have talked to some folks about maybe potentially changing coverage times. Um, we hear from downtown, they're concerned about sort of those cuffs, the nighttime hours. Um, so I think um, they've committed to reevaluate after 30 days to see kind of how things are, are playing out. And they may look at piloting some different hours as, as the process moves forward. Um, they'll also work to form a steering committee to kind of help talk through some of those operational um, decisions. 
which will obviously include stakeholders as well. Uh, and I did include a summary. Uh, again, here we are sitting at $695,000 in startup operating funds to establish uh, a resource center and outreach effort um, that would involve the addition of 9.6 FTE supplies and rent for one year, and now a vehicle now that the two locations are separated. Um, and just as an aside, you know, some of the conversation that I had to follow up with Josh too was specific to if we have a resource center, we have a vehicle, then we have an opportunity to transport somebody to an appropriate place at night. Um, and obviously they're supporting being able to do that provided that meets the individual's needs. Uh, Councilor Trumbull? Yeah, I guess even with this uh, vehicle, this current request is still 3,000 less than the original mm -hmm. proposals. So 694, 699, 92. I would move that we fully fund this request. And I really appreciate the fact that Hale has worked with the different groups, especially the downtown group, to try to uh, come to a, a workable plan that everybody can, can live with. And I think this is actually uh, uh, the money that ARPA funds are meant to be used for. And I think uh, hopefully this will help a lot of people and it's got the potential to help a lot of people. So hopefully it will. Second. Councilor Davitt. Um, so yeah, a hearty second to that. Uh, just so impressed with with the way folks have worked together in this, um, and excited to see where it can also grow to. Um, and particularly like thinking about how hours might work, and and going back through over you know, a month of of outreach. I just I, I'm excited to see what this can do for us, and just am very impressed with the way that Josh and Neil have been able to work and connect with folks. It's it's been great to see that way. Councilor Pelletier. Uh, thank you. Not that we do thirds, but thirds. On this. <laughs> I, I'm also really impressed with the way that Heal has built bridges with other organizations and has thoughtfully listened to all of the stakeholders in this process. I think it means that when this program begins, that they're going to have a ton of community support. And this is hope, what we envisioned when we were asking uh, organizations to come to us with proposals is that they would do this kind of networking, bridge building collaborative approach. So very excited about this. Councilor Yakubaga. Um, I appreciate Josh's efforts. I mean, we had a lot of conversations, asking questions, and want to make sure that we have the, the best deal, let's put it this way, so that everyone is really happy with the outcome. Uh, my question is because I see the statement from downtown partnership dated September 27. Uh, so is this older than the meeting we had last time? Is this? That's the second statement from this them. This is the yes. second statement. After okay. the um, proposed change to okay. have outreach downtown and the resource center itself uh, at the Hancock so Street location. So when, 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 when they attended the meeting last time, mm -hmm. I, I did not feel they still, they, you know, I mean, they supported the work of right. the, but I did not feel they had the, like full, let's say full agreement on, on this. Anything changed since then, Josh, in your relationship, so communication I, with them? I would say that that letter came after that meeting. After right. that meeting? Correct. Okay. So okay. the meeting was on the September 25th, okay. Okay. and right. then they had an opportunity okay. to kind of circle back to their right. own group okay. and come back and, and proactively provide I'm that. I'm so glad to hear you guys, you reached to this, because I thought this one before the last meeting we had. This statement. So I'm glad to see that this came yep. afterwards. I think for this work to be successful, we really want this communication between you and the people in downtown Bangor. I mean, without this, I, I truly don't see how this will be successful. So I'm glad to see that they they are happy with the outcome, how whatever you guys you you worked it through, and that you will be working and collaborating with the city department of public health. I think that is. A huge. I think that's a huge for the success of this program. Awesome. Thanks for David. Thank you. And I just wanted to point out something in there that I don't think has come up really in the conversations is that they're also intending this for citywide. Like it's not right. just a downtown thing. And <laughs> that is something we all know we need and we've got a lot of organizations are looking at it in that way um, necessarily. So I appreciate that that's a, a, a big lens on it. Councilor Sprague. Um, and I have a contrary opinion on this. Um, I don't believe this project should be funded uh, for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, it's it's a million dollar program, a million dollars a year in this program to take care of maybe 
20 people at a time. Um, I think that's an excessive amount of money. Um, I think the money that we're being asked to provide it is to ramp up operating expenses to a program that I do not believe will be ultimately sustainable just by uh, getting some additional compensation from Medicaid, which is a small amount, and a half a million dollars a year from selling drugs at inflated prices. Um, I think if the 340B funding program is not a solid funding program, I don't believe it was meant for a project like this. This is proposing not just a support center, but a medical practice that's referred to as a medical practice in the literature saying that we won't have enough operating revenue and medical practices of this type, it takes six to nine months to ramp them up. So I don't believe we, I don't really want to fund that type of practice. There's no definitive information on the number of people who will be uh, served. We have multiple, uh, outreach coordinators throughout the city. There's no real indication here of how the outreach coordinators are going to work together. Uh, it's just said that this will happen, but I don't believe there's anything in here that really documents that that will happen. Uh, and I think that while the write-up Debbie read wasn't Debbie's write-up, but it was information provided, I don't believe that the level, this is not a, a program where multiple organizations are coming together and saying, this is a program that we all support. From throughout our homeless discussions, we've talked about the need for multiple organizations to work together. And I don't, I while this references that they will, I don't believe that there's sufficient evidence here that that's going to occur other than there's the statement that we're gonna do this. Um, so we've got a million dollar program, questionable funding, limited number of people who are going to be served, a lack of coordination with the other outreach workers in the community, and it's a feel good project. But I think it is pouring several hundred thousand dollars worth of gas fire that we have not been able to otherwise adequately address. And uh, I don't believe it is going to show sustainable results. Other comments? <clears throat> we have a motion. We have a second. Uh, as always, go around the table. Councilor Yakabaga? Yes. Councilor Trimble? Yes. Councilor Leonard? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Davitt? Yes. Councilor Sprague? No. I will be a no as well. All right, next up. Yeah, uh, spray. Yes. So during our July 18th uh, ARPA workshop, counselors did recommend an award to Wellspring pending a final determination by the state of Maine as to what, if any, funding would be awarded for renovation and startup costs of um, their relocation and expansion of not only detox beds, but um, sort of those gap housing needs um, for somebody who continues to need a little bit of support. Happy to report that Wellspring recently received notice that the State of Maine Office of Behavioral Health has agreed to fund the proposed renovation and startup costs um, of Wellspring, Wellspring's planned expansion. Um, Wellspring um, then had some additional work that they would like to do. Obviously, when you're asking for funding to actually get your new um, expanded services open, you really want to focus on what you actually, the core needs. Um, so, they had made a request, uh, asked if the city would consider um, a change in um, use or an amendment. Um, so I provided the information here as to whether or not you'd like to consider that. And it is to do work outside of the, the exterior of the project um, or grounds improvements, um, uh, main steps, ADA accessible, uh, landscaping, sitting areas, uh, outdoor recreation, um, and then ensuring that the premise is such that the people need to get outside as part of the overall treatment plan, um, important for addressing mental health side of addiction. So I throw that out there to see if there's an interest by the council to, to consider a, a change in the proposed use of um, ARPA funding and the, the um, estimated cost for 
a change in the project is, is at 441,000 versus the 597.5 that the council had previously committed to support Wellspring or up to, I should say. Councilor David. Thank you. Yeah, um, I would. I won't make a motion to we had something, you know, beyond just the intent, but I would definitely support um, it coming back to us and just looking at it in a revised way, as particularly with the um, what they want to do with the outside and the steps and the ADA. Um, I think it's definitely something that should we should look at, and it's less than we'd also originally intended to give them. So, second. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Councilor Sprague. Um, I believe this is a completely separate project from what we originally approved. Um, this, mm -hmm. and if we were to have received this project as part of the projects that were submitted for review by the United Way, it would not necessarily have scored high enough to be considered. So I think it's unfair to any of other applicants mm -hmm. uh, to see us reviewing a separate project now for something that was not originally requested. This albeit complementary to what we had approved before, but it wasn't, this is not for what we were asked to approve. And thus, I, I don't think that it uh, should be considered unless we have additional funds left over and we open up the process to other applicants that can in fact compete against this proposal uh, to see which project has the greatest merit for this $400,000 worth of funds. This wasn't what the original project was meant to, to do. Well, they're going to concentrate. Clarification. <clears throat> so is this the same project? It's the same is? location. Right. And that funding was to buy the building before, but now they it was want to renovate to the whole building. Right. Now they want exterior work. Okay. Now, right. Okay. So it's in the same location. And it's is not a it's not a Bangor location, right? It is not. Okay. Well, we knew that before anyway. Mm -hmm. So but it's going to benefit a lot of Bangor mm -hmm. people. I, I mean, I understand what Council Sprague is saying, but I think it's not like it's a completely different. It's the same project. We're just funding a different part of the project. So, I'm, I'm, I'll be. I think I would still be supportive of it without starting or going back to square one. Other comments? <clears throat> um, I would certainly be supportive of the request. Um, but to the same degree as what Councillor Trumbull had just said, um, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think it would have scored uh, probably just as well. <clears throat> but, so what we're doing here is really kind of cleaning up the outside, putting in ADA, uh, making sure it's compliant. Councillor Spray? I just, I just add, I think this is a, for me, it's an issue of fairness to other applicants and other people who have <laughs> additional needs. This, what was originally proposed was fully funded, the state funded it. It wasn't what we were asked to fund. And I, I think we're being asked for an, an additional project. Now, granted it's on the same site and granted it's uh, related to the same business, but it's not what we were asked to originally fund. And I think it is uh, unfair to other uh, organizations that might have needs to simply say, well, gee, we gave them the money the first time around and they got funded, so let's let them spend it on uh, other things. Uh, I don't think it's an appropriate process. Other thoughts? <clears throat> I didn't see a motion. I didn't hear a motion. You what? said you might. Well, my, my motion, to hear everything. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I would say, I mean, I would sort of, I, I do think we would, it would be good if we had a like actual, you know, what their, where their budget came from to give this new estimated total, that kind of piece. But I'm, I'm happy to make a motion just on this intent. Um, but my thought was that we need to ask them just to give us something okay. built out to show that. I um, but I would, overall, I support it. I just, <laughs> I have a question, please. Yes. So the estimated cost is 441. The original application was for 597 and 500 dollars. So the 441 is it an in addition to the 500? No, instead no. of. So it's even less. Mm -hmm. So how come it's less than the original application? It's not the same thing. It's not this. They got state funding for the original. Plan. So the original application was to do the interior work. Yes, yes. 
I the state that. has agreed to fund all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So their suggestion was if the state's agreeing to fund all of that, do we have an opportunity to address the exterior? I see. Yeah. And that was the request. Yeah, I don't have any issue with that. I think every aspect of this project is going to help in recovery. This is how I see it. Outdoor, I mean, we the intention was to support this project. And I don't see this as a separate one from the original one, even though it's not the same one. This is how I see it. Happy to accept the motion. I would uh, move that we fully fund the new request at $440,540. Do you wanna make it subject to getting that additional information or not? I just- I Yeah, no, no, it's fair. Go. I just didn't. Yeah, no, no other, okay, subject. Okay. I mean, uh, could you be subject to the city manager approving? It doesn't have to come back to us. Yeah, that would, I could, okay I with that's it, fine. You know. And then it would come yeah. back to us at full council. If there's, yeah. if yeah. there's a discrepancy, we can do it under, to us, yeah. I do have a full breakdown of the budget. Second. Second. Thank you. I was like, I can second you right now. <laughs> we have a motion. We have a second. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments? We'll do another roll call. Uh, Councilor Yakabaga? Yes. Councilor Tremble? Yes. Councillor Leonard? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? No. Councillor Davitt? Yes. Councillor Sprague? No. That would be a yes. All right. All right. Next step. So we were getting ready for, whoop, you skipped one. Okay. No. Next step. We have the uh, discussion on council operating. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you skipped it. I ahead. did skip. Yeah. Okay, so as we were preparing for year end, we realized we'd never done the appropriation resolve because unlike most grants that you actually apply for, this one just showed up. So just trying to clean all of that up for first reading and get it wrapped up with this council. Uh, so that is the resolve. I also included a funding status update. So I included sort of the same outline that we've been looking at, but trying to get to better more refined information as it looks at by how uh, the money has been, A, that details all of the applications um, that we've received versus the applications that had been reviewed. And I'm gonna tell you that first page, I, I skipped a, a line, so it's really 41 in total. Um, the amount requested um, that the council has reviewed is 25 point, just under 25.3 million. Um, so far you have awarded uh, 16.3 million. Um, you just awarded another 694,000, but we also have 100,000 coming back from the mm -hmm. uh, from the um, wellspring, or 150,000 mm -hmm. coming back. We still have um, sort of the broadband discussion and the public restrooms. We actually have found some um, kind of unique things that Portland did. Um, and the cost is about $30,000 a unit. So we've got some staff working on that. So I didn't want you to think that had gone by the wayside. Uh, we had a number of items that we hadn't funded. So I, I tried to break it out a couple of different ways. I broke it out by how the applications came through, uh, whether it was applications received by the city, the partnership with Penobscot County, the broadband priority that we had started, and then the government services area. And then on the next page, I did another further breakdown um, that identified the applications received and reviewed by area of emphasis um, and trying to tie a dollar amount to each one of those as well. And then for each of those awarded amounts below, um, if it isn't clear what that is for, um, the detail is broken out as to which items have been funded. Thank you for providing that. Very helpful. So this this, this 4.7 million, that would be before tonight's votes. You the have uh, an allocated funded. Right. But so that's before we correct these votes tonight. Correct. So what would we vote on tonight? 1.5? No. 1.3? No. So 694 yeah. minus 150. Yeah. So you're at about 540. Yeah. yeah. Um and then um when you say 4.7, I'm getting a little bit unallocated, uncommitted, unallocated, uncommitted balance. Oh, okay. Is I'm that, trying to figure out which page you're on. Like the first yes. page. The 4.7, and yeah. that does not include um, the potential for broadband. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Other questions? 
Right. Um, and then I guess it was sort of the next steps. Um, just. I'm sorry, Councilor Pelletier. Thank you. My questions are going to be on the homelessness housing staff and grant writer. When yep. are we posting? What is the status of those positions? So HR is writing the giving uh, HR some grant manager positions to do. So they are working on that job description. The housing position, I think with the recent changes um, that we're all looking to implement as it relates to a rental licensure registry, a short-term rental, the need to gather, gather data. I think we've now got the pieces together to have a complete position. So um, Ian Craig and I were talking about that earlier as we were looking to build out the housing FAQ um, and talking about how we're gonna sort of use it as a, as a bridge between community and economic development and code. And potentially that's the place where if an individual has a concern about um, the housing application piece, mm -hmm. is that that's the point of entry for that that is also the ability to manage the vacant and placarded property more effectively um, because we are asking an existing staff to continue to add. So our thought is we're gonna combine those worlds, those pieces to have a more complete housing position that's um, full. Um, the homeless position, we're still sort of trying to figure out what it should look like to be the most effective. Um, you know, I've got individuals who were struggling with outreach, um, we are struggling with data. We don't need to, we need more housing navigation services. So we're trying to work within not only our own group, but with the other groups to say, what else do you need? Mm -hmm. um, I think what we've done is we've started the conversation and we are looking to hopefully wind down sort of the really focused effort on um, out behind Hope House and say, what are we gonna be able to do sustain our efforts going forward and what do they look like? And I've had conversations with both the CEO of PCHC as well as CHCS. And it's not to go off script too far, but this was in manager updates. Um, interestingly enough, um, last week or two weeks ago, it was last week while I was on vacation, I was out of the office, received a notice that, um, Representatives of both Bangor and Portland have now been invited to participate in weekly meetings with all of the HUD TA efforts that are underway in Maine. So it is not Bangor, we've, we've kind of completed our HUD TA. Mm -hmm. Portland's in the middle of their HUD TA. But there are also some initiatives at the state level related to HUD TA. So for once, we're going to have all of the parties having one conversation. Mm -hmm. which is going to be a huge win, I think, because I think that times it isn't always clear that the continuum of care is focused here. Um, the state agencies, whether it's MISHA or uh, DHHS, they have their areas, and we're just struggling saying you, you're not listening. Bangor and Portland are having struggles that we don't think are being fully recognized. So it's going to be a great to have that opportunity to first all to be together. Yeah, and what I will say is, that shouldn't be you. That should be no. somebody else's full-time job. Because I think, you know, my perception is the work that you're doing right now, that you have been leading for months and months, that has been consuming the vast majority of your time, is a full-time job that should be run by somebody else. And so I would be in favor of us expediting the search for that person, even if it's going to take a while to figure out exactly what the role looks like, so that we can relieve the burden on you and the other city staff who've been sort of stepping in and filling bits and pieces of a homeless patrol. And I think there is, I think what we're trying to find is where that right balance is. Yeah. Because it is difficult for a position within the organization to say that there's going to be an uncomfortable and awkward discussion that's going to happen with another CEO. It, it has to start from your CEO. Sure. Um, I also think that um, we have sort of that relationship with HUD TA. So um, there are other city staff who have been invited to participate in that. So it is not wholly me. Um, so just looking to find where we can create the right break, because I agree. I, I don't need to be into it day by day, but I will also agree that had I not been into it day by day, that the city wouldn't have achieved the level of credibility that it did with the HUD TA, with the providers, we've built a rapport, and now it's time as we transition to a new, to 
to move that rapport on. Mm -hmm. Don't disagree. Councilor Thank you. I think following up on Councilor Pelletier's comments, um, like when we originally talked about this position, mm -hmm. we talked about the, the need to add additional staff depth to the city, not somebody else to do more outreach or somebody else to do any more clinical position, but somebody to manage the city's homelessness package of activities. Um, you know, we introduced uh, the government operations committee a, uh, a set of action steps, a 12 to 18 month set of action steps to deal with homelessness. One of them was to uh, have additional staff, to have a homeless coordinator position. But essentially, uh, I envisioned that coordinator position as somebody who would manage that package of activities. Um, it needs to be moved out uh, into a separate position and not consuming so much of the city manager's time. Uh, we do not have the depth. And one of the reasons we haven't made more progress is we haven't had enough depth of staffing to do this. The council agreed to provide the resources to have this position to add an additional full-time equivalent worth of depth to work on homelessness issues last December. And here we are in October, and we still haven't added that depth of resource. So we put forth that we needed them. We haven't hired them. We haven't added the additional capacity. We have a draft plan that needs to be managed, and we don't have the depth of resource to be able to complete that management. So I think it's time that we uh, saw our action on this item and that it was no longer deferred. Other comments? Second. Right. I don't think there was a motion. <laughs> no, but I want to ask you another question about the, uh, the housing position. Are we adding additional depth of staffing to uh, work on housing issues? Yes. Yeah. And so we're going to have another person. Yes. FTE's yes. worth of housing. Yes. Because okay. I think that's the, that's the same, where we had said that there wasn't enough depth of staff to deal with housing. And that's been on the agenda since the budget discussions in the spring of 2022. And so we're 18 months later, and we still haven't added that additional capacity to deal with housing issues. Um, and, I, and I think that that's, that's not right. Other comments? <clears throat> I guess for uh, further uh, elaboration, I think the state has a goal of, uh, what was it, like 84,000 homes need yeah. to be completed by 2035. Um, we're going to just keep it a real. Bangor is the second largest municipality in the state. We have to be in that fight as well. And so that also has to be a major priority of the city to be a leader, not just for Penobscot County, but also just for central northern Maine, I would argue the entire state as well. We, I, in my opinion, I think we got a, a really good um, initiative and start, but we have a long road to go. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, thank you. All right, next up. Um, yep, so following, I wanted to kind of provide at least the starting point for you all to have a discussion about your council operating policy. Um, and when I looked around at different examples, um, a lot of the examples Councilor, are very, oops, sorry. Um, sorry, I just didn't know if we were going to talk about the oh, next steps. Yes, sorry. Yeah, we got, um, yes. So with the balance of funds, um, did you want to consider revisiting applications? Did you want to look for identify areas to consider allocating additional funding to? One of the questions raised is if at the end we hadn't, we didn't feel we had put enough money into a bucket, would we want to look at adding money to a bucket specifically and doing maybe a different targeted outreach? Um, there's been conversations about revolving loan funds. Um, the conversation was about essential worker pay. Uh, were there other government services? or weight opportunities or a combination thereof. 
and other under governmental services. I just need to throw out last week's infrastructure committee meeting where we talked about sidewalk mm -hmm. plows. Um, there was um, four or five committee members present, all of whom expressed support for allocating if there was money available with $400,000 for sidewalk plows. Um, if that is something that you all wanted to discuss and move ahead right now, that would be helpful because winter is coming. Councilor Dada? Yeah, I would, um, it did seem like there was consensus last week, but I would make a motion that we um, use $400,000 of ARPA money to fund purchasing new, new sidewalk plows. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Um, questions, comments? Councilor Tremble? I'm not feeling either way. Just how does that fall into the cycle of buying sidewalk plows and what's going to affect when the life of these sidewalk plows run out? I mean, it just seems like an odd use to offer money for so, sidewalk plows. Right. So this was really just to expand fleet. Mm -hmm. um, so that. How many do we have at four? Five. Five. Correct. Um, because, but they're some, subject to breakdown. Right. Thing because of barriers in the sidewalk and debris that they run into. And the thought is, is that if we could expand to seven, that we had a much better chance of having five running all of the time. Mm -hmm. So it's meant to create a spare pool, if you will, mm -hmm. um, that gives this motor pool and the fleet services staff time to make the necessary repairs to bring items back on. The one year- Are we buying we had... snow blower plows or blade plows? The, snow, the blade plows don't seem to be that effective in Bangalore. Are we buying snowblowers or blades? It was snowblowers. Snowblowers. It was a set. Yeah. Okay. Snowblowers. Oh, so Aaron had a really good memo for last week's that because at, at one point we only had one of five plows operating last year. Correct. Right. And right. he did say that even if, if we had all seven running, he does have staff to run all seven at the same time. So Correct. and I guess I just I think yeah. I just support that because it means we won't have a very bad winter if we buy these plows. <laughs> No, I'm not saying, you know, we can't get them all. Oh, we this can't way. get them in time. We can't get both, but we might, we likely can get one. Right. Yeah. Um, like, it, my, my personal opinion here, if we can, I mean, after the, the, the getting some money for the for the snow plow, um, I'm thinking about maybe visiting some of the applications that were dismissed uh, regarding maybe mental health essential workers and child care. I don't know. I feel it's I feel it's worth it to visit some okay. of the uh, like those three areas. I don't know what other counselors think. That's all right. I, I support the request for the snow plows. I think it's compatible with a, a lot of planning that Aaron has done to prioritize the routes and largely built off prioritizing them around providing better access to the schools. Uh, and I think that was a very important piece of what we wanted to accomplish um, and to address youth. Uh, that's, that's one piece and it, it would support that. The, I think the other piece is a different discussion. So I'd like to defer that until after we vote on the first one and then come back to sure. what Councilor Yakabara has said, if we can do that. Councilor Leonard? Uh, actually, I'll, I'll hit on the second point Councilor Spray brought up. Um, I, yeah, I think that is a, a discussion that I think is appropriate to discuss at this uh, meeting, but I think it would also be appropriate to say that we probably need more time to really consider as a council, like what those potential next steps are. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, in regards to snow plows, I mean, the, the citizens want us to get better with it. Mm -hmm. Public works needs our support. Um, this is, this is a, a, a must for us. So it's, um, it's very necessary, especially if we're going to have a potentially hard winter. All right, so let's move on the uh, snow plows. Uh, yes. We have a motion, we have a second. I'll do a roll call vote. Councilor Yakabaga? Yes. Councilor Tremble? Yes. Councilor Leonard? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Davitt? Yes. Councilor Sprague? Yes. I'll be a yes as well. Councilor Trent? Right on the balance. I mean, I don't think we're going to decide this tonight, but I would no. just throw out that, uh, and I don't want it to be, a token amount, but if we could identify, you talked about one of the options would be essential workers. I would favor once we decide what we want to do with broadband, 
and we figure out what the balance is, and we identify what we could. I think any anybody that was still working in the city in the spring of 2020 in essential workers. So do you do, do a look back, and if somebody's not here anymore and they were working then, do they get part of the money? I would like to see us divide that and give out a payment to essential workers that worked for the city. And I think anybody that worked for the city was an essential worker. I'd I'd give it to everybody, but I don't want to do it if it's a token amount. If it, if it comes out to a substantial, a decent okay. amount of money, I would support that. But if it's a couple hundred dollars a person, I don't. I think it's you know not okay. significant to people. But if it's a significant amount to make a difference to people, I would support that. And and I would think everybody was a essential worker. Councillor David. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, that's the proposal I've made quite a few times um, that we use this um, in that way. Um, what the city manager had indicated to me last week was that they had looked into it um, and that there wasn't, I, and I'll let you expand yeah. on that, but that you had said that there wasn't a clean, because that's something I've been wanting to do. And I completely agree with you. Councilor. If we keep going down, it's going to be at the point where it's not exactly. working. Exactly. But, mm -hmm. and some of the concerns that I, when I was trying to think about a way that this all work, and then I was like, hey, staff, can you figure it out? <laughs> um, and they had some of the same, because there's a lot of it of like, how do you go back and see who was, you know, do you go back to who was working when, and then part-time employees and things. Right. Like, that seems like something in theory right. that could all be I mean, cool. People, again, places but, must have done yeah, something like exactly. this. We can look yeah. at what other people have done. Yeah. And so, figure something so out. in yeah. some of the parameters that you know I think Councillor Davert had initially suggested is looking at the period of the state of emergency. Right. So from the period from the point in time that so we did have um, three areas in which we were paying premium pay um, during the stay at home order for that first three months. Um, it was um, public safety and public transit um, and then go from that date forward and say, look at all of the hours worked. We did talk about that the fact that, you know, an individual, I can tell you that we have a lot of part time seasonal employees, especially as we went into summer. Well, what do we have? Is that 500 full time people? Uh, we got just under, uh, just under five. Yeah. Just under right. five. Yeah. But we have a lot of part time and seasonal employees, and I will tell you that their ability to keep playgrounds safe and open mm -hmm. 100%. was a huge right. win for mm -hmm. lots of people. Mm -hmm. The same thing for the golf course, the same thing for, um, you know, everybody was trying to be, it was the rejuvenation of being outside, mm -hmm. um, you know, after sort of a lot. So I can certainly, I could have, and I'm, I'm assuming the finance director is listening to me, is it going to, we can pull the number of hours um, worked during that particular mm -hmm. one year. It, it's just, a, um, I can look at what the average rate would be. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for supporting me. Welcome. Councilor Sprague, um, coming back to Councilor Akrobatis' points, um, I, I'm not enthusiastic, or I would not be enthusiastic with the council going back and looking back at projects we haven't funded. I would be more enthusiastic about doing a hard think on things that we might like or feel that we really needed to accomplish. And then target that funding to those things, even if we have to ask for some additional applications. So I'm thinking, for example, there's a, a number of indications that we have significant access barriers to children in the community for mental health services. We outpatient mental health services, diagnostic and treatment services on an outpatient basis. The main proposal we got for mental health services was $2 million for inpatient capacity of a project that was already going to be carried forward. But I think we could go back and say, we've got some additional money. We don't feel we've made enough of an impact on outpatient access for children for mental health services. And we were, would entertain ideas for how that could be improved and target the funding to something like that, where we know that there is a specific gap. Uh, at least I, I think council would benefit from a conversation about those kinds of alternatives. And I won't object to that. I mean, in the end, it's what's going to benefit, you know, of bank or and children. It's definitely um, that's what we think for our future. Like if we take care of them as children, we we prevent uh, adversities that can happen in the future. So I, I won't disagree. Councilor Dada. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would sort of I would support going back and, and looking at things, just looking at the mental health is where we like didn't put as much, although we know that 
there's a lot of crossover between, right. but if you look at just that 434,000, um, so I would, I, and I didn't before this meeting, I should have gone back and looked at the things that the pros that we didn't move forward, but I, I would be open to, to going and looking at those that might fit some of those bills, but also if it makes sense, um, I don't think I'll be on council at that point, um, put a request out for possibly more things that are targeted as Councilor Sprague suggested. Anybody else? Um, Councilor. I also, just, I also just want to say that if there's further collaboration with um, other organizations, mm -hmm. whether they be the county or whatnot, those should also have priorities where we can really compound our ARPA dollars with other people's funds as well. I think that just one more quick thing. I, I would love to see more proposals come forward where four or five organizations get together and jointly submit a proposal rather than proposals being submitted by one organization saying that they would collaborate with others. You know, I think joint commitment of the organizations and their boards to doing something together is more forceful and much more likely to be successful. And we saw, I think, none of those uh, during uh, uh, our projects we funded so far. I may have been missing something, but I don't really think that was there. Uh, but I think it would be worthy of, uh, if we were to ask for uh, additional proposals that would be fundable, uh, I would consider working with those types of proposals and not single organization proposals. Yeah, my comments would be uh, that we not go back and revisit everything that we turned down before. Um, I would like to uh, look into teaming up with the county. Um, I think they have a couple of mm -hmm. applicants that are still out there. Um, we just haven't seen it yet. Um, and lastly, uh, the revolving loan fund. Uh, I know we've done a little bit there, but uh, I think there might be a little bit more stuff that we could potentially do then. All right. Um, if I, I could I ask for a vote on whether people think we should go back and look at the other ones because it does seem like there's differences opinions on that. Um, as far as it, like I, just so that if there's not a majority of counselors who want to go back and look at the ones we previously turned down, then that would be good to know. But if there is a majority, then we should do that. I mean, I think maybe when we have more discussions in the future, I think that's how where we can vote and see if we wanna, because this is not like the original conversation we're gonna have, we're gonna revisit this. So okay, yeah. I think when we do, maybe we can have this. So I agree. Yeah, right? I just, yeah. My, my concern yeah. would make sure that, that we don't, it doesn't stop here yeah. based on certain cool. comments, yeah. but not everyone else weighing in, that's all. So I, I agree, Councilor. Yeah, yeah. and I'd, I'd agree with that. And plus there's gonna be a change of counselors. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna hog tie them. One way to do All right, good. All right, we're off of ARPA and moving on to Discussion on council operating policy. Yeah. So, in looking through lots of examples across lots of governments, there are, they're pretty much, they're very, some are very limited, is what they put out. Some are very comprehensive. I think for us, going to a comprehensive approach is going to be very helpful. And I started this is just to try to get at the crux of the near term um, needs. I think the opportunity to kind of add meeting protocols. Um, there are new, new counselor. I know in the, some of the new counselor packets, we sort of give you the one cheat sheet about this is how you move something. Counselor Schaefer has referenced, you know, hey, it would be great if we had a list of acronyms because we use a lot of acronyms. So trying to build it out from there. Um, so what I did was just um, base this on an example from another community. Um, uh, what I did try to get to specifically was I highlighted in gray the areas of emphasis that the council seemed to want to, to be sure that we were focusing on. Uh, the first item that we come to in gray is the, um, the um, election of the council chair. Um, so the council can set any policy it likes as to how it operates and as to how it nominates. Um, so what, what I did was I took a couple of different things and just kind of put them together and said that on your first organizational meeting when everybody is sworn in 
typically the first item, you have a council meeting and the first item is to elect a chair. You don't need to do that. Um, you can actually do your swearing in. You can have a meeting. You can take nominations. You can allow somebody to make a nomination. You can request that nominees you know, provide a statement, if you will, at that point. You can come back later that night and you can vote at that point if you'd like to. If you would like more time than that, there's a way to do that as well. Because if you have a council who's already sitting as council chair, that individual can continue in that capacity. Or you can you you can elect a chair pro tem. So there are a multitude of ways. It's just how comfortable you are with the length of time. It it, it becomes very compressed. Because you swear, mm -hmm. you know, it's you got to swear people in at 10 a.m. Period. Mm -hmm. But what you don't have to do is you don't have to do the next step is to elect a chair. You can actually take through a process. I tried to highlight some um, considerations when you're considering a chair. Um, the city clerk can take the role. They can call the vote um, later on. So I just throw that out there as a starting point. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Um, I know it's something a lot of us have been talking about for a long time. Um, I really appreciate the way that the um, having someone do a statement of qualifications in that piece. I would be what I would, I think, like to see, and obviously want to hear from everybody else, would be, yeah, not having to elect a chair at that 10 a.m. meeting. Right. Swear people in. Do the discussion piece, then people have time to think about it. We know people will be talking to each other ahead of time anyway, as well. But to get that information and to have the public be able to see it. Um, that way, if there's folks who want to contact us and say, hey, I would like it if you supported so and so for chair, um, that's always helpful too. Because um, right now, the public has really very little role in it unless there's like behind the scenes discussions. Um, and then, to, but to have that election happen that night so that because the council chair appoints the committee members and so much of the other business would come out of that. And I'd Personally, rather have that come from whoever was fully elected rather than a pro tem, um, because at that point you're also if you're waiting for the next full council, that means we lose a, midi, a week of committee meetings or everyone's temporarily put, uh, put, you know put to their chairs of the committees and that could change later. Like I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Um, nominations, everything. 10 a.m. People talk about why they should do it, um, and then that evening have the vote. Councilor Sprague. I think the selection of the council chair is inseparable from the role definition. Um, and one of the things we talked about in June, and it's unfortunate that it's taken so long to get back to this. One of the major points of discussion in June was the concept of leadership. What we expected of a council chair in terms of their leadership, what we expected in terms of committee chairs in terms of their leadership, that's nowhere really defined here. Um, but I thought that that was what we were saying at the time, at least that was my opinion at that point was that the leadership discussion was critical. What does a council chair do in terms of providing leadership? What, what does the council expect of their leader? Um, and looking ahead into the next year, uh, as, an, as a council person with experience, assuming it's going to be not one of the newly elected people, but that the uh, councilors would look ahead and say, uh, what type of leadership do we need? Uh, what, what's our agenda going to be? And who's going to lead us uh, to do that? Uh, not just to chair meetings, uh, not just to represent the council in public. Uh, but to pr provide that leadership role and work with committee chairs, uh, establish the agenda um, uh, with the city manager, uh, set priorities, uh, and to uh, manage the, uh, the scope of activities uh, that the council needs to address. So work with the business and economic development chair on uh, what's the economic development plan going to be, or work with the uh, ch chair of the uh, uh, government operations on what the plan is going to be for uh, uh, homelessness or work with the chair of the uh, business and economic development on what the housing plan is going to be. And I would prefer to see someone stand up and say, I want to lead the council here over the next year. This is where I think we need to go. Uh, and uh, I would, uh, and then for the council to say, we'll follow you. 
but I think somebody who wants to be the council chair should stand up and say publicly, I want to be the council chair. This is why I want to be the council chair. This is what I want fellow councilors to support. And it should be very clear what the leadership role is going to be. And this council has not done it that way. Uh, but I think we'd be in uh, the council. I won't say we, because I won't be part of that. But I say I think that the council in the city would be much better for having a much clearer concept of leadership uh, and somebody who was wanted to be the chair who said, I want to provide that leadership role. And uh, I think uh, that uh, that's something this council should discuss, I believe, before it makes a selection of its next chair. Councilor Leonard. To buttress uh, Councilor Sprague's points, uh, well, actually, before I do that, um, I actually think it's uh, a you know, I I appreciate putting the qualification um, bullets in there. I actually think that's a bit of a misstep because to buttress Councillor Sprague's points, we don't necessarily know the type of leadership we're going to need. I'm totally fine with uh, listing what the duties and expectations of what uh, a council chair is to be, but I don't think we should have uh, guidelines of like how counselors should elect a chair because we can't really determine what the future is going to be for how a city is going to be led, um, whether we're in a crisis mode or if we're in a mode of, uh, of growth and prosperity. Um, that being said, um, I, I think uh, uh, to um, I, I think you mentioned this point, Councilor David, uh, I, I think we should keep this a very simple approach like mm -hmm. We should essentially have nominees. I I, I actually like the uh, just one council counselor being uh, just nominating someone. Um, have that statement, have that vision, what the mission is for the council to achieve, and then uh, have that voting process wherever that uh, uh, determined time is. Um, I have a few other notes in in this as well, but I, I mean, uh, uh, but both Councillor Dan and Councillor Sprague uh, uh, covered the majority of what I wanted to uh, say. But but effectively, I I don't think we should list qualifications uh, of what we expect a councillor to be. And the reason why I say that is because it also says in this uh, uh, document that. Uh, the role of a chair is um, effectively the same as any other counselor as well. There's no other uh, separate issues of powers besides nominating uh, the committee chairs and the uh, coordination that they do with uh, the city manager. Um, so uh, if you are a city councilor, you are qualified to be a city council chair. And that's the way I look at it. Councilor Trumbull. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think there's two issues. And one is the process of electing the chair, and the other is the role of the chair. I think both of these are fairly well uh, discussed and, and taken care of in the city charter. One, I mean, the changes are suggested changes to the election. I don't think they're a big deal. I think they're, they're fine. I think the only thing I might add is if only one person is nominated that morning meeting, then it would eliminate the need for a vote at night. That person automatically become some type of language about that. <laughs> but I think either way, I don't think it's going to change what happens. I think everybody's going to know, I think, still going into that meeting, who the chair is going to be, whether you have this process, I have the process we have. Going into Monday morning, people are, are going to know pretty much who the, who the chair of the council is going to be. As to the role of the chair I and mean, we I think some of this discussion has come from people who aren't happy with the council manager form of government want to see a mayor council manager form of government which I think is the wrong direction we don't need a strong mayor I mean people might want one we could have a charter change and get one but our charter is a council manager form of government we don't have a strong mayor I've always seen the council chair similar to the uh, chief justice supreme court you're first among equals. We're all we all have the same vote. Nobody has more power than anybody else. The chair runs the meetings and appoints the committees and represents the city during the year. Uh, I don't think the chair needs to have any more 
saying what the policies out of the city are going to be. We we come to a consensus on that as, as, as a council and uh, the city manager helps us and guide us through these things. I, I just think it's, uh, I think what we've been doing as far as the role of the council chair has worked pretty well. And I, I think if we want to change the role, then maybe we want to change, people want to change what the type of government we have in Bangor. And uh, I think we're, it's worked pretty well, so. So, Council so, Leonard. Uh, so I I wasn't really prepared to talk about a uh, the, the option of a, a transition of a, a council manager relationship to a council mayor manager relationship. I mean, I, I would like to see that discussion just keep it very real at some point in the future, especially with the new council uh, coming up, because that's a, I think that's a discussion we should have. I think that should be saved for for later, because um, I do have um, obviously strong opinions, just like Councillor Tremble on uh, on that subject matter. But uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Councillor Yakabaga. Yeah, I think this mayor uh, conversation can be postponed, <laughs> but definitely, I mean, we can discuss uh, this with the new council, but. Um, I like how you know we we nominate people and you know and if they want to do it yes if not that's fine and maybe in the evening to to share why those who accepted it why they want to be uh, a chair. Uh, I think the role of a chair I would like to see it as someone who helps ensure that the goals that councillors put together when we meet right after election that those goals are being uh, uh, executed are being implemented uh, if not following up on those and making sure that we are on track um, making sure that the plans that have been maybe postponed for a reason or another are taken care of so i feel leadership communication uh, commitment to the work uh, i mean there is a lot to it there is a lot to it it's it's a lot of work but I think to be effective, it's we want to make sure the goals that we agree on are being taken care of, making sure we are on track. Dr. Dallas? Thank you. Yeah, I would just add to that to what Councilor Akibaga said. And again, like I don't know that we need like to the council owner's point as far as like listing you know, in yeah, it kind right. of thing, although I do think that's helpful as a context. Um for me, one of the pieces and I was something I thought a lot about when I was chair and didn't always do great is that I, I do think it's a responsibility of the chair to communicate effectively but from because they're the one meeting with the, the city manager to make sure all of the counselors have the same information um even if it requires individual phone calls ahead of a meeting like that which is completely ethical appropriate communication um to be clear um and making sure that everyone is on the same page that way I think that is a, a, a role of the council chair I don't know that that requires an opening of the ordinance necessarily, but I do think it's something that should be really thought about when someone is chair and how that would work. Dr. Sprague, I'd just add an additional comment to that. I think one of the things the council chair does is appoints the uh, members of the various committees uh, and the people who are chairing those. And I think it's incumbent on the chair to be saying, okay, what do we really expect out of those committees during the next year? What do we expect them to accomplish? What's the agenda that has to be managed by those committees and who is willing to work on that? Um, I think if we, uh, you know, and that's why in, in uh, government operations and in BED, we've been putting together uh, a list of issues which are carryover issues that they're gonna be carried over from one year into the next for at least consideration uh, by the, uh, the new committees. I think it's up to the council chair working with the city manager to say, okay, how are we going to structure these committees in such a way that we can accomplish what we have to accomplish? Who's going to be good at finance? Who's really going to be good at uh, helping us with economic development? Are they committed uh, to working on those topics? What do we expect the chair to do in terms of managing, working with city staff, the agenda that's before the, that needs to be managed? Uh, on behalf of the council and committee. Uh, I think that should be part of the discussion. And I think that's a key leadership role of a city council chair 
uh, when making um, when making those appointments, and and then subsequently working with the committee chairs throughout the year to make sure the committees are uh, are working to task. Um, I think we could do a bit better there. So, wondered, and uh, I I don't know if we're jumping the gun too much, but I did have some comments on um, on committee chairs and and whatnot. Uh, I. Are we are we okay to move on to to that topic, or do we still want to discuss the chair at this point, um, or is it okay if I just talk? Go about ahead. It? Okay. So um, actually, I think it's really important to set up future committee uh, chairs for success, and um, the ability to have a document to give to the new committee chair. Hey, this is what was uh, happening last year. This is everything that we encompass. This is our vision statement. This is what we completed. This is what we still have to uh, accomplish uh, uh, from our overall mission statement from the city as well. And the ability to just have that document and being able to give that information on mass to the incoming uh, committee chair is that is huge to make sure we set them up for success. But also it's important I think it's important to make sure that as a council, we also groom people to also be in these uh, committee chair positions or even chair positions. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not the, the biggest fan of uh, someone coming into uh, a, a committee chair or even chair position fairly new, but I, I recognize that sometimes you know, we don't always have uh, the appropriate uh, uh, agenda or or people that are ready to take on those roles. I understand life happens sometimes and uh, there are things that prevent others from stepping up into these leadership roles. But I, I would actually like to see um, bef before the council chair actually um, nominates and, and, and brings forward who the committee chairs are going to be counselors who actually want to uh, put a step toward this leadership position to say that, hey, I actually want to do this role, give a list of reasons why, so that it makes it easier for the chair to make a more informed decision on who really wants to do this task in this moment in time right now. Because there might be a year where, uh, I'm just gonna pick on people that, uh, Councilor Yakubaga, um, is really great for government operations, but then maybe she takes uh, a bunch of finance classes and has a new finance degree and she decides three years from now, oh, I actually want to be the finance committee chair at this point. So, um, but but also um, it, in regards to the chair themselves, what I would also like to see is um, whenever there are meetings uh, for these committees, I, I, I would like to see the uh, minutes of the previous meetings provided in uh, the, to be supplied with the new meeting agenda as well, just so that we can have a pretty good idea of what the previous discussion was coming into the next meeting. Um, I also think that the agenda should be adopted at the beginning of each committee meetings and uh, and and also if there are any new items that counselors want to bring on to uh, uh, subsequent meetings that we should create space for them at the end to discuss those items that way we don't uh, bombard the com uh, committee chair last minute with the uh, new additional items um, obviously we can't always prevent that from happening, but I think creating a space for that to happen in real time is a, uh, it will be very helpful for setting up that committee chair for success. Uh, I'll stop right there, right? I know that was a lot. Anybody else? I think this is good, good start, good conversation. Um, what I'd like to do, especially as it relates to the role of the council chair, is to find a place to have this, this if you have particular, I just did this as a starting point. It sounds to me that most folks aren't. So while folks do appreciate some of the things to consider, some folks don't, it would be 
helpful if I had a, a little bit more. Um, We're looking concise. No, I know. At the, um, <clears throat> what uh, Councillor Trumbull said, I, I really think the morning of, I think it will probably already be decided um, to a large degree. If it's not, then we can kind of open it up and have those discussions. But, you know, what are your leadership skills? Why Why do you think uh, uh, this person is going to be better than another person? And we, and we can have those discussions. So what I did here. Okay, go ahead. All right. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the committees go, <clears throat> I, typically, if the, the council chair, the council chair has been here for a couple of years anyway, and usually that person would have the knowledge of uh, those individuals uh, to be the various committee chairs um, and what would be the, the best fit. And typically, there are conversations that happen uh, to see uh, what would be the good fit. But I don't. I don't know if we're really changing too much. Yeah, I mean, I thought there seemed to be agreement on having right. nominations in the morning and That's a vote at night. I'm, yeah. that. I'm fine with that. Right? Even if we, even if it's no, I mean, I guess the only reason you wouldn't have the vote at night is only one nomination. Other than that, you'd have the nominations in the morning and the vote at night. Councilor David? Um, yes, I reaffirm, reaffirming support for that. And I, I think. I just, and I think this is part, maybe part of why we've had this conversation so many times, that it is for me, the idea that everything's decided ahead of time and that's just a matter of fact, um, has been consistently frustrating um, and very much that we've always done it this way. And I get that that's often how we've come to the table, but my, my hope, my overly optimistic idea here would be that when people hear each other speak about it, that that is actually a way that it, it's impacting their decision. And at the very least, you as the chair, even if there's only one person nominated, need to to tell the public why you want this role. Um, yes, public is not voting for you specifically on this. They voted to elect you to the council. So big points on that front. Um, but I think that explanation needs to be made to your fellow counselors and the public has the right to hear why versus I nominate, you know, whoever second unanimous vote, we're done. Like, I just, I don't think that's the way we should be conducting business if we're to keep trying to be more and more open to the public on that, so. Council Pelletier. Thank you. I also think that regardless of what we put here, conversations are going to happen behind the scenes. I think if somebody wants to approach leadership in such a way that they want to have a very strong agenda for the year and encourage other counselors to, um, to become part of that and work together as a collective group uh, to accomplish those particular goals of that strong leader, then that's something that happens in those private conversations. Um, I don't think us writing into statute that somebody has to be a, a leader who wants to come with a set agenda and wants everybody to get on board. Some people just don't need that way. There are other different and um, equally valid styles of leadership. And so I think um, what is written here is a, is a good start. Hopefully it will make the process, begin to make the process a bit more transparent, give people a bit more time for reflection and hear perspectives that they may not have considered um, so that's that's where I am. Councilor Sprague, uh, a couple of comments. The council has about three weeks to figure this out. I mean, if there are going to be any changes, so it's got to get done. It's got to get discussed, and the changes have to be accepted before the um, Monday after the election. Um, I think that. There will always be some conversations that people have prior to that meeting, but I think Councilor David has spoken of this before. I would agree that it shouldn't necessarily be all figured out without any public comment and public discussion by Monday morning. You know, where uh, behind the scenes everything gets negotiated and there's, there's no public process. Um, and I think whoever wants to be the chair should stand up publicly and say, I want to be the chair and this is why I want to do it. Um, and, and maybe that's after a nomination is made. 
uh, that that occurs. But I don't think it should be like Councilor David just said. I don't think it should be just a nomination and gee, does everybody agree and a vote and you know no public discussion or no public statement by the person who's going to be the chair about uh, what they, why they want to do it, what they hope to accomplish, and what they feel is important. Councilor Belcher, that, if I understand what's written in this draft correctly. That is what we're talking about here, giving somebody an opportunity to state publicly why they feel they're qualified to serve as council chair. I still don't think, regardless of what's written here, you're going to prevent people from having conversations prior to that meeting. Um, I also, looking back on personally, the, the first council chair uh, conversation I was involved in, I don't know that having a gap between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. or 7.30 p.m. would have changed my vote or that hearing from other people would have changed my vote. So um, I'm already pretty sure of what I think will be my approach for this time around. And so I, while I, I believe there are lots of um, valid reasons that we want a chair to stand up publicly and say what they believe and why they want the role, I, um, I, I think this goes far enough in helping to make uh, a change to the process to enable more conversation to be had. Actually, I think you got both both last year. You got the 10 o'clock and the 7 right. 30, 30 <laughs> vote. <laughs> so to that very specific part of the vote in the morning, um, and then, or sorry, swearing in, hear from people, vote in the evening, unless there's only one person in the morning, what do we need to do to enshrine that? So I can put a council order okay. together that will lay that out. If, if folks want more time to kind of digest the larger policy, but that seemed to be the direction that I felt folks were in, and I'm I'm happy to do that. I will, and we'll work out the mechanisms. It's likely that you will have an order on anyway at that 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. And if there's more than one nomination, that procedurally that we will. I'm going to use the wrong term, suspend the meeting in essence and delay it, delay the vote until later. But that way, if you only had one nomination and you wanted to move forward at that time, you'd have the opportunity. But if you don't have the item on the agenda, you don't have that opportunity to do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. All right. All right. Uh, manager updates. Um, it's Pardon. Yeah, I just I didn't know. Um, I know you'd highlighted a few different things in here. Yeah. Uh, so these manager, were the so could, Yeah, I wanted to if we could go through those. Yep. Yeah, so the the one was about the I I just tried to add in there the committee chair will serve as a resource for other members of the committee mm -hmm. under the role of the committee chair. Um, pointing out that the public proceedings were back to it's three or more persons. Mm -hmm. That's what constitutes a public meeting. It does require a public notice, um, and those were the three large. Takeaways. I also tried to wrap in. We've done some additional um, sort of clarification on political activities. So I tried to pull yeah, all of that. Those in. weren't great. Those they were not. So, so those are already. So of, that was the conversation that we'd had um, in a public council workshop. Okay, so that's already that's what we've been dealing with. Yeah. So, and that was the only other thing that was highlighted, which I just wanted to say yeah. I appreciated, was that the putting the disclosure statements on the city's website. I, yes, I think maybe a constituent. Oh, I did miss that one. Thank but you. Just, um, so I'm just, I think that is a great step yes. in terms of transparency. Yep. And that way, it's actually maybe a way for us to track it more accurately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have it in a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It would be nice if it were like this. Councilor Leonard. I, I just have one small question, actually. It's uh, under the role of the chair. I forgot to bring this up. So, mm -hmm. The council chair appoints three to five members to the city's five standing committees. Does that mean we can have one person serving multiple committees? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. We all, yeah, there's always at least one person on two committees. Okay, thank you. Yep. And it's it, the way the ordinance read, it's three to five, but historically it's always five. Mm -hmm. I think they all call for five. I think the airport used to have three, and some of the small less Actually, committees the had three. Is written that way, three to five. Oh, so we, all of them could have. Less? Yeah, I think oh. so. Okay. Councilor uh, Sprague. Um, I, I don't think this has to be. I know this doesn't have to be resolved. 
But uh, one item for some further discussion, I would suggest discussing the uh, what constitutes a quorum. Uh, I think one of the things that has concerned me a number of times during the course of the year is when we don't have a full quorum at a committee meeting of committee members. We end up pulling in another counselor so that we can say, oh, well, for tonight, would you serve as a member of this committee so that we can have a quorum? That means we establish a quorum with people who aren't necessarily prepared for the discussion that evening or to vote on or to make recommendations. And in theory, uh, or practicality, you know, committee members are supposed to do the work before the committee meetings and read the background material and come prepared for the discussion. And if they're not there, and we just pull in somebody who is not fully informed to establish a quorum, uh, I don't think it's fair to anybody who is um, expecting our action uh, to be well-informed decision-making. Um, and I, I think that uh, it may at times be better to postpone those meetings until there is an actual quorum of prepared committee members uh, than it is to go ahead with a meeting, just pulling on somebody else to establish the quorum. But I think that takes more discussion. Anything else? So um, we're going to start off with um, some sort of, um, you know, shout outs to those who are doing presentations in our community. You know, recognize Council Appellate Chair for their presentation last week at the MMA, Beyond Pride Month, fostering LGBTQ plus in equity and inclusion in municipalities year round. I understand it was very well received. From our group. Thank you. So I just wanted to share that. I sent you an email earlier uh, this afternoon on Monday and Cree will be participating in the Housing Matters event at the Wells Conference Center up, up in Orono. And this is about aging in place. So that's kind of a unique housing event. On Tuesday the 17th, Ann was actually asked to attend a session of the legislature's Joint Select Committee on Housing, which is being hosted by the University of Maine. It's a day-long event. It has a tour of their advanced structures and closet center an aging in place panel discussion, a session on construction workforce development and building technology and research and innovations, a presentation and demonstration of energy efficiency solutions for underserved communities. And the day is gonna conclude with the tour of the tiny host development in Outer Hamas Street because we were the first community, I believe, to do a tiny house um, ordinance in our community. Aaron Hootery will be speaking at the Maine Resource Recovery Association's annual meeting and workshop on October 23rd as a representative of the Municipal Review Committee. He's gonna provide attendees a history of the Hamden facility with a focus on the efforts made to take ownership and find the right partner to reopen the facility. Innovative Solutions, who is the MRC partner, will be on hand to present the detailed plans for reopening the facility. So that's a win. Um, and I kind of told you about the, the HUD um, news. So I'm pretty darn excited about that. Um, and just to remind folks that what we'll, what I had done last year for you that you've seen in all life was do sort of a council year in review. Mm -hmm. So we'll do that again um, at our next meeting. Thank you. I'm just gonna step in for council paper and you can executive step in unless oh. there's anything else. Yep. Yep. Council of here. Yep. Just to say, you know, it was an honor to be asked to speak at MMA. I was very, very proud to be able to stand up and talk about the long history that Bangor has in openly, repeatedly, unequivocally supporting our LGBTQ plus citizens. It's clear that not every municipality has strong leadership that allows them to do that, whether it's because the folks that they have elected are less than supportive or um, public sentiment isn't quite there. And people were very impressed with, um, Again, Bangor's very, very long history in being a leader at the forefront. So I did make it clear, and our assistant city manager can attest, that I was not speaking on behalf of the council, um, but I was very pleased to be able to share some of the things that we do year in and year out to create a very welcoming and safe place for everybody, but especially for LGBTQ folks. So thanks. Great. Thank you. Councilor David. I would move uh, one MRSA. Oh, or, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't see the hand. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Councilor Pertier, for your presentation. And it looks like it was awesome. <laughs> Thank 
thank you for your efforts. Um, I have a question, please. Um, maybe I should have uh, mentioned this prior to the meeting. Uh, uh, we received, like I, I personally received a couple, three pictures about uh, a car that was um, mm -hmm. like uh, broken into. And mm -hmm. I think it was not broken into. It was, there was a fight maybe between. Mm -hmm. So this was after my conversation with you about you. Mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned that the outreach team and mm -hmm. you know they will talk to yeah about whatever is going on behind the hope house yes. but it looks like some more activities afterwards yes. happened there so yes. can you please i don't know if yeah if so the next outreach me meeting is tomorrow mm -hmm. so the outreach folks were supportive um they've worked and we've worked with the individuals that are actively working with outreach to kind of um, begin to navigate their way into housing. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked to them about our desire to want to kind of connect with the individuals who are not engaging in that reading mm -hmm. and who are, to your point, yes, it was a fight up there. So there was, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think there are more concerns by especially parents of students yeah, who at the university, the university there. Yeah. And I think yeah. we need, like, you know, to address yeah. uh, the escalating uh, violence there and in the, that area. And yeah. the outreach workers are supportive of that to the okay. point that, you know, there are times, depending on what's been happening, the outreach, the outreach workers won't go out, on, out there alone anymore. And they haven't for some time. Um, and they are concerned, and they're concerned for their own safety, but they're concerned for the safety of the individuals mm -hmm. that they're working to support. Um, so they are going to work in concert with us to hand the notices out to the individuals um, and to let them know you're going to have X number of days. You can't be here. Um, we're not saying you can't be in the city. We're not saying anything. We're just saying you can't be at this location. Um, and if if necessary, we'll issue, um, you know, citations for trespass, criminal trespass notices to ensure that individuals are not on that site. And that, and as importantly, that we're protecting the safety and health of the individuals who remain committed and connected to working uh, with the outreach staff to, to get on their path to permanent housing. Yeah, I mean, it looks like it's unsafe for uh, some of the enhanced population there, yes. it's unsafe for outreach workers and yeah. for the students as well who attend the University of Maine at Augusta Bangor campus. So it's yeah. it's going to be a win for everyone if we kind um, of, you know, put an end to this criminal yeah. activity there. All right, third time's a charm. Um, thank you for bringing that up, Councilor. Uh, all right, I move executive session one MRSA four hundred five six A personnel matter. Executive session one MRSA four hundred five six C economic development. And executive session one MRSA four hundred five six E consultation with the Council Member. Very well done. Is there a second? Second. Roll call vote. Councilor Yakabaga. Yes. Councilor Tremble. Yes. Councilor Leonard. Yes. Councilor Pelletier. Yes. Councilor Bagley. Yes. Mr. Sprague. Yes. All right, we'll make it unanimous.